Right. Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. My name is Dylan Brewer and I'm a student worker here at the Biotech Center. On behalf of the Biotechnology Center, UW-Madison, Division of Extension, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night 50 times a year. Tonight, it is my honor of introducing you to Chris Saha. Tonight, he will be teaching us about how the use of gene editing is helping to treat blindness. Before we get started, we're going to ask him our five questions. Where were you born? Urbana, Champaign, Illinois. All right. And where did you go to high school? In Huntsville, Alabama, Grissom High School. All right. Yeah. And where did you go to pursue an undergraduate degree? I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. All right. And what did you study while there? Chemical engineering. All right. Awesome. Yes, and, yes. <laughs> and where did you go to pursue any advanced degrees? Um, I did a master's of philosophy at Cambridge University in the UK. It was really a lot of fun. Um, and then I did a PhD in chemical engineering at University of California, Berkeley. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Chris Saha. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, um, and thank you to the organizers for giving me uh, the platform to tell you about our, our work. Um, I'm, I'm so excited that, about um, this emerging uh, project in our lab, and it's really a, a pretty large proce project of trying to change um, the letters in the genomic code within the body and within specifically the eye, and within the eye, a specific part of the retina. And so you'll try to see how we're trying uh, to make our interventions precise, uh, how we're designing these technologies, and uh, kind of where we are. And so th um, what you see here is really at the top here a picture of, of DNA, the double helix, as many of you um, have seen in many places. Um, and then there's this um, blue protein and RNA complex that comes in and, and attaches to a specific part of this. And at the end product, you want to change a part of this code. And so I'm going to start off with a human story. And um, this story is of Michael Kalbrer. And he was treated with a genome editing uh, candidate uh, in, in phase one uh, a few years ago. And it this trial was the first uh, gene editing treatment that was introduced into a human body. Um, to directly change you know, the code within a tissue. And um, they reported the results uh, about a year ago. And um, Michael um, had a really nice um, interview in NPR and said this was really uh, a joyous moment for him once he got to see um, you know, colored lights kind of for the first time at his cousin's wedding. And so these uh, changes might be small, but they're very meaningful. and. Um, you know, those are the types of changes that we're aiming for um, with some of these interventions. There is another um, gene therapy out there that uh, uses a different technology apart from gene editing. That's called Luxturna, uh, and that's approved for uh, some types of um, inherited blindness. And so to uh, go to the basics a little bit, um, Genome editing in general is this idea of being able to precisely and intentionally change a base or a letter in the DNA. Uh, this is a stretch uh, of the human genome, and I've highlighted this T, a thymine base, um, that can be, um, is, is a problem in uh, a set of patients. And this set of patients uh, have a dystrophy or a problem with the center of their eye, and this uh, type of dystrophy is called macular dystrophy, and a rare form of this is cost, called best vitelliform macular dystrophy, or best disease for short. What these patients see is what's shown in this picture. They have problems with their central vision. So you can imagine how hard it is to um, um, progressively lose your central vision. And uh, this is really uh, caused by this single change uh, of the T, which normally should be a T, uh, C in, in healthy individuals. And so uh, I'll come back to this sequence in the middle of this presentation, but one of our goals is to be able to take this one letter in our human genome of three billion letters and specifically change it 
back to, uh, we think, a healthy um, uh, base such as C. And this work is built upon uh, a really breakthrough in the field in, in 2012. And this is uh, called the CRISPR system. Some of you may have heard it, about it. And it was um, featured in a book by Walter Isaacson on Jennifer Doudna, who was one of the uh, first people to describe the chemistry behind this system and won the Nobel Prize a few years ago uh, for her discovery and contributions. Uh, the way this works is that this protein in purple uh, can bind this short piece of RNA. This is much like the mRNA uh, that you've seen in uh, vaccines, but shorter. And based on the sequence of that RNA, this protein will scan the human genome in teal, find a mutation uh, that you want to uh, edit. If it matches the orange sequence in that RNA, uh, this protein will make cuts in the genome, and you see those cuts happening here. And that's really what um, stimulates an, a repair process in our cells to go in and um, fix that broken ends of, of DNA. If there's this template that you have inside the cell, it will be used to write in that sequence based upon the template. And so this is one example of genome editing. I'm going to play this video again, uh, just so um, I can talk through some of the assumptions that remain in this video, because in some ways it's obviously a cartoon and a schematic, and there's a lot of challenge in having this actually occur within every cell of your body. And so if, if I can do that, one second. All right, so um, to tell you a little bit more about this system, this orange piece can be made very quickly. So my students in my lab can order the sequence if they want to change a, a different part of the genome really overnight. And that's one of the powers of the system. Um, and this uh, enzyme here can be engineered to be more uh, precise and specific uh, to various parts of the genome. Uh, I'll show you a fair, few variants of that. Um, one of the um, specific challenges here is getting all of this machinery into a particular cell uh, well enough. And so that is so, the so-called delivery problem as well that we, we've been working on. Uh, some of the repair processes after the break um, do not use the template, but rather slam these ends together too quickly and make unintended um, outcomes. Um, and so we are uh, trying to figure out how to control that type of process as well. Um, and, and so really, this is a, it's an amazing system. It's a, in, in some ways a four-component system that all has to come together well uh, for it to work. But it does work. And um, some of the uh, projects that we have up outside of the eye include uh, trying to edit parts of the muscle, parts of the liver, um, also in the brain, um, there's a lot of work at UW-Madison that's been collaborative with all these types of editors that uh, address muscular dystrophy, metabolic diseases, liver diseases, and um, the broader field is very collaborative. And so we've been fortunate to be part of a large effort um, called the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Consortium. And this consortium is... Um, about five years old, and the first five years was focused on making uh, tools, different ways to deliver that machinery into different parts of the body. So what this um, video is showing you from the NIH is that you know we want to hit really the right type of cells in the eye that we think are affected by disease and, and spare the others uh, to make this as safe as possible. We want to be able to make our changes as, as precisely as possible. So there's various types of editors that have been um, developed, and we need kind of new um, systems to evaluate these strategies before getting into patients. So uh, transgenic animals and um, other um, tools, human-based, stem cell-based tools even, that uh, could make small tissues on chips to uh, understand uh, the outcomes of these strategies. So that's been in development. Um, 
Wisconsin was uh, really the only institution that got two of these awards in the first round, so we're very happy about that. And we've had a lot of momentum for five years. Um, what I've shown before in that cartoon was this uh, complex called uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and what this slide is telling you is that there's many variants of that. So there's been all of these different uh, colored dots or different proteins that have been fused uh, together with that machinery to make different types of edits. Um, and one other type of editor that I'll tell you about is called a base editor uh, that avoids making a DNA double strand break, but makes instead a single base edit. Um, I'm happy to go into that into question, in questions, um, but uh, I will tell you some of the work that have uh, been focused on really um, delivering this effectively in the eye. So state of the art, as many of you know, um, to get new types of DNA sequences into human cells has relied on um, re-engineering natural viruses. These um, re-engineered viruses are usually called viral vectors. And some of the common ones are shown here on the schematic. Lentiviruses come sometimes from HIV that have been engineered. Um, retroviruses, uh, you know, one of the more, most common ones is influenza. Um, and then other viruses as well. They have different abilities to uh, enter various tissues in our body. Um, and by engineering them, you can have them not carry in a uh, viral specific set of sequences, but rather carry in the sequences that encode this CRISPR Cas9 machinery. And that would allow us to make those proteins and RNA into the right cell. As, as I've shown here, there are some issues with using these types of viruses. Um, one of the um, most concerning issue is that uh, humans and um, many patients recognize viruses and have an immune response to them. And so you can um, do that usually well uh, the first time by managing the uh, immune response. But if you try to redose a second time with the same vector, you, you have antibodies that will neutralize it and T cells that will kill those infected cells. So redosing is a big challenge. Um, and it's also a pretty complicated manufacturing um, to uh, make these types of vectors. And lastly, um, for genome editing in particular, you only need a really short burst of activity because um, changes to the genome persist, uh, at least in theory and uh, we've seen in practice. And so you don't need this um, virus to keep uh, turning on this editing machinery for the lifetime of the patient. And that's what most viral vectors do. That usually, once you enter, uh, you have uh, poor control over how long the virus um, expresses the various genes that they're expressing. And so in this case, we've um, been working together with uh, a nanomedicine chemist, Sarah Gong, who's next door to me at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. There we've uh, been able to make a small nanoparticle. So nanoparticles are about uh, a fraction of the width of a human hair and uh, extremely small and can be taken up by cells in a number of different ways. Um, one of these ways is shown in this cartoon. This is the nanoparticle that uh, is uh, engaging with the surface of the cell, the cell membrane. It can be taken in and there's different ways um, to have these particles kind of uh, elude and escape the natural processes of degrading um, little particles. And so um, we have some chemical uh, components within the uh, nanoparticle that fall apart once it comes into um, in, inside the cell in the cytoplasm. And, um, and it can also uh, induce uh, lysis or uh, essentially bursting of some of these intracellular um, compartments that uh, it needs to uh, escape such that this machinery that we're loading inside the particle can actually eventually get to the nucleus where the genome is. 
there's various types of ways that we can load these particles. We can have proteins, we can have DNA, we can have mRNA. And um, some of the formulations I'll show you use these different versions. So with that type of introduction, I want to dive into uh, two cases of uh, using these types of nanoparticles inside the eye. The first one is this particle that we developed uh, about four years ago. And um, what we've done is uh, tweak the chemistry of these um, monomers. Uh, so these are um, chemical components that can come together to make a polymer on the surface of this uh, Cas9 CRISPR complex. So this is a crystal structure of that protein. It has, the surface of it has a, a very heterogeneous charge. So the um, red and the blue uh, talk about a negative and positive charge. And our um, monomers and uh, chemical components have also positive and negative charge. And uh, if we get this formulation just right, we can essentially um, make this nano coating on top of the protein and um, RNA complex. And so we call this a nano capsule, or NC for short, containing a ribonuclear protein, uh, or RNP for short. It's um, a lot of acronyms. I'll try to uh, uh, guide you through that. And so this, in the end, is, is the particle. If we look at a, a single cell that has been treated with this particle, um, we can stain the genomic material and the nucleus in blue. And um, some of those compartments that I told you where things can get stuck inside the cell are stained in green. These are called endosomes. And that CRISPR-Cas9 machinery called a ribonuclear protein complex is stained in um, red. And what you'll notice here, if you merge all of them, there are some yellow bubbles. So this uh, protein is stuck in the endosome in some cases. But then we also clearly see some red inside the nucleus, where it's actually gone all the way to the genome. If we look at the particles themselves um, under the microscope, uh, very high resolution. This is a 50 nanometer uh, scale bar. These are about 20 nanometers in diameter. Um, they're very homogenous, so they're, because each of them contain ar uh, arguably uh, one of those uh, protein complexes. And one of the nice things is that we can freeze them down, thaw them, reconstitute them, ship them, and they all retain activity, which is um, shown on the y-axis here, after various ways of freezing and drying them. And so the experiment that we've been doing is to see, does this work in the eye? And so if we um, remind you of the anatomy of the eye, um, we have light coming in through the front, and in the back you have the photoreceptors that uh, transduce that light signal um, into uh, really electrical signals that go through the optic nerve to the brain, which is behind here. Um, and if we zoom in on the retina, this is an incredibly diverse and dense layer of photoreceptors. You have your rods and cones that can detect different types of colors. But importantly for, for this talk, there's a back layer that's very thin and might be hard to see called the RPE, or retinal pigmented epithelial layer. If we zoom in here on a uh, micrograph, um, and uh, by staining different layers of and cells of this retina, uh, this green um, layer is a set of proteins uh, that is specifically um, on in the back of the eye. And these proteins are impor important for vision because they help um, transport uh, various types of ions between the front part of the retina and um, the back behind the retina where there's a lot of blood vessels behind there. So it turns out one of the most metabolically active parts of your body is the eye because it's constantly seeing light and constantly trying to uh, communicate that. And so uh, if you have small disturbances of uh, this back layer, you end up over time losing uh, the health of these photoreceptors and then having your central vision problems. And so, uh, surprisingly enough, it is safe to inject material into the back of the eye, really behind the retina. Uh, this is from that approved product called Luxterna. Uh, their package insert shows um, this 
technique called subretinal injection that can be done safely by a trained pair of hands, not by me. Um, and uh, these surgeons, and we've, we're fortunate to have a lot of these surgeons that are really skilled at this uh, here at UW. And so they're part of this team, and um, they assure me that this can be done quite safely and has been done uh, by uh, these surgeons um, hundreds of times a year, right? So this is our route to hit that back layer of the eye. We can actually bring these um, nanoparticles really to that back part of the retina. If I, if I just um, remind you of this uh, layer here, you can see all these different colors are different types of cells. If uh, we put one type of uh, particle here, it can be, it can be um, uh, taken up by multiple types of cells, and really all we want to hit is the back layer. And so one of the things that um, my lab uh, looked at was this natural uh, set of uh, communication between the back layer. This is the RPE layer in the schematic in blue, and the photoreceptors down here in this layer in um, yellow. And what this cycle is showing is a natural recycling of retinols that happen between these layers um, called a visual cycle. Specifically, there's a type of retinol called the all-trans retinol that is um, naturally taken up and moved to the back of the eye. And so our idea was to take that all-trans retinol, which is shown here, and put it on the surface of our nanoparticles and then see whether this can preferentially go towards the back of the eye upon injection. And so the study that we did was to take mice, um, even smaller, so it's actually even harder to inject into the right place, uh, but there are trained people uh, here, in, in, in particular in Bikash Patnaik's uh, group, who's in pediatrics. Um, so we take our um, solution of nanoparticles that's in this schematic purple, goes to the back part of the eye. There's uh, what's called a bleb, which is exactly what you think it is. It's a um, bunch of fluid that has um, essentially um, been stuck in the back of the eye, but over time it um, resolves and the retina comes back together over two weeks. And so what we do at the end of two weeks uh, is we take out the eye and uh, we peel off the back layer and we have to cut it um, because it's naturally curved to flatten it out for our uh, microscope to see it in one uh, image. And in this mouse, uh, any gene edited cell turns red. And so um, this is one eye at high magnification here on the left, and on uh, the right is the entire eye. Uh, what you see are really pockets of red, right? So these are gene edited cells. Um, they have what we would call a cobblestone morphology, which is um, what you expect from the shape in the back of the eye for that layer of retinal pigmented epithelial cells. And so this gave us a lot of confidence that we can hit the right cell type well with the right type of um, genome editing. And so if we go back um, to our human um, case, this best disease case, um, we uh, wanted to see what would happen if we had a very specific editor uh, against this T. Um, so we can hit the right cells, but can we hit the right sequence in the human genome? Uh, to do this, um, some background here for Best Disease is that it's actually a dominant uh, a disease, meaning that if you have one of these copies of um, the mutation, this T to C mutation, in the affected parent, any child that has that effective, uh, that um, copy will be affected. It doesn't matter really what the unaffected parent has. So it's, it's a dominant trait. And so um, one thing in these affected uh, children uh, is that they have a, usually a healthy copy from their other parent. And so the goal here is really just to destroy this T to C mutation, this copy, uh, that, that uh, mutation. And what many people call 
these types of dominant alleles is a poison pill mutation, because if you have it, um, you're going to have the disease. And so that's uh, exactly what we ended up testing. Uh, I won't go into the full details. We've published this work. We um, essentially have our CRISPR machinery go and cut out this um, bad copy. And what happens uh, for this best disease gene is that it ends up making one of these channels. In this case, it takes chloride um, ions and transports it across that cell layer. And if you have uh, problems at a number of these parts of the protein that's encoded by the DNA, uh, you'll end up essentially clogging this channel or closing it up or not even having a functional channel. And that's what leads to disease. And so what we are, are hypothesizing is if we cut this out, um, the channels that you would see in these effective children that have a mix from the two copies would only come um, from uh, the, ch the channel would be only coming from the healthy copy. And so um, I'll summarize a lot of work into one slide. And um, it is a, a dense slide of a lot of sequences. And I'll, I'll walk you through this. And so um, this is a uh, sequencing run that we've done on human cells that had this mutation. And we can read out every um, set of uh, letters at this part in the genome. And so that C to T uh, mutation is shown here. And the percent of reads that we get in total uh, from a sample are, are shown here. And so uh, an affected individual at the beginning would have 50% uh, and 50%. Half of their uh, copies would have the C, and the other half would have a T. So after genome editing, what we see is that we have 56% from the C correct copy and 12% from the mutant copy. And all of the other outcomes have uh, some small changes. So if you look closely enough, you will see that here is an extra G. Um, so that's an insertion of a G. Over here, if you look at closely enough, there's two bases that are deleted. Um, over here, you have, I'm trying to see what the difference is. I think it is an extra G as well, plus um, a change down here. And so you can map all of these. And because our genome is read in um, basically triplets, these are codons that encode our protein, if you just shift your reading frame by one, you end up making uh, a protein that is essentially nonsensical that the cell can um, uh, detect as nonsense. And there's a process called nonsense-mediated decay that essentially um, does not make any functional protein from any of these um, reads that have a shift of one or two uh, bases. And so those are called frame shifts. And to our surprise, um, really 95% of our outcomes had frame shifts. So this um, really does con um, confirm that if we were able to do this type of editing, the outcomes in our cells, 95% of them should um, only have functional protein from your healthy copy. And so we are effectively destroying the mutant allele in um, around 38% uh, of the copies that are there, which effectively um, rescues you know, on the order of 80 to 90% of cells that, that got this type of editing. So that's one case. There's other cases as well, whereas you don't have a dominant poison pill mutation. So this is the inheritance pattern that I showed earlier. The other one is a recessive uh, case. And this is a more common case where uh, you might have par parents that are not affected but carry a mutation. And in one fourth of the cases, there's a child that gets both of the mutations that are problematic and um, they're affected. So this is. Um, usually called a recessive uh, mutation. Usually you have a defective copy on, on, on both your paternal and maternal copies of the genome. 
And this is in some ways a harder case um, for genome editing because we don't need to destroy, but we need to fix. So the case that I'll, I'll uh, share with you over the next uh, 10 minutes or so is, is this case called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, it's also a terrible disease uh, that affects um, really uh, uh, quite a lot of people. It's genetically diverse. So uh, that first patient, Michael Culber, had a form of this disease. Um, but it's, it's uh, individual base pair change is different from the ones that uh, we're studying here in our study. Um, this is uh, some pictures of the back of the eye. There's buildup of, of, of um, various uh, toxic byproducts that shine um, here in, in yellow patches that stick of this disease. And so um, we have a, a set of patients, in particular there's one patient that we focused on that has a particular mutation. So uh, the top is the healthy here, um, and the bottom is uh, the patient that we call W53X. Uh, what this stands for is that the 53rd amino acid essentially it becomes uh, a stop codon. That's what the X is for, meaning that the um, cell does not make any further amino acids and does not make the full gene. Um, and the stop codon is TAG, so that's that triplet that tells the cell to stop making am uh, amino acids, and that's not what's supposed to be there. There's supposed to be a G there. And so here, both of the copies are um, problematic, and we can't just go in and cut it and, and, and make these frame shifts that I showed you earlier. What we have to do is actually fix this mutation. And so here we use a different type of editor called a base editor. Um, and this is taken from this national consortium. Um, and this can be encoded uh, in mRNA. It's actually a little bit larger protein because it has this extra uh, uh, domain on here that makes it very hard to actually put into traditional viral vectors uh, or into our nanocapsules. And so we had to come up with a new nanocapsule um, the details of the internal structure aren't, aren't too important other than the fact that it has some of these same elements that help it fall apart inside the cell. And here we've loaded it with mRNA, uh, similar to what you would see in these um, uh, mRNA vaccines, but they're much longer uh, mRNA strands. And in this case, they're encoding this uh, CRISPR uh, base editor to change specifically A bases in the genome. We also made um, a, a mouse that has this uh, TAGW53X uh, mutation. And so this is um, probably a, a two-year process that it took us to make this mouse, but um, our, our team made this. And so now we can um, deliver our nanoparticles against this uh, uh, human relevant sequence to see whether we can fix this mutation. And um, we did all of this work. We actually got um, the genomic changes through the sequencing assays um, quite specifically and is um, summarized in this, in this new paper that's coming out. I wanted to share with you some of the functional studies um, of these mice that have been treated. So what we do is we take this mouse and in, inject with our nanoparticles. Um, there's a lot of jargon here, but at, over the last uh, few weeks post-injection, we monitor um, the visual function of these eyes. And the way we do this is a technique called electroretinogram. So uh, we don't have to um, sacrifice these mice. We can do these in, in mice that are um, really roaming around in cages. Uh, but we uh, take these mice and uh, shine a series of lights. And uh, there is an arrow here that's going to come back and play again, I think, um, that follows the light through the different layers of the retina. And if you uh, track and sense, put electrodes near the eye, you can see these characteristic waves that come from 
uh, various parts of the retina engaging with that light. And so uh, there's something called an A wave that has to do with photoreceptors. Um, there's a B wave with a different layer called bipolar cells. And actually there's a C wave that's not shown here that's very specific to that back layer of the eye, that uh, retinal pigmented epithelial layer. And that C wave is what we are showing here in a section of the eye. Um, and so in a normal eye, this is a cross section of the eye. Uh, and then this is a eye that was treated with a base editor, but the sequence of the RNA was kind of a nonsense sequence. What we call a non-targeting RNA is uh, what we think should not have an effect. And so we see some um, um, C waves, this is an amplitude of those waves um, in some parts of the retina, but it's not very robust. The amplitude of them is, is usually flat. And when we treat um, with our base editor nanoparticles that has a RNA that's targeted against that mutation, uh, we get a really nice amplitude as expected and the structure of the eye, the layers of the eye, are, um, are, look quite well uh, through this uh, imaging technique called OCT. So if we look at um, uh, lots of eyes that have been treated over time, um, this is zero to 10 weeks on the x-axis and on the y-axis, this is the amplitude of those waves, those C waves uh, over time. The ones that have been base edited um, end up keeping uh, this amplitude uh, or increasing over the 10 weeks, whereas the ones that have been um, not edited are usually or edited with that um, RNA that does not recognize the mutation uh, end up dropping over time and never really recover. And so this is a one-time injection and we see stable effects over 10 weeks. Um, and longer now that we've been looking at these mice um, for, for more time. And so this has uh, been part of an application that we uh, sent to NIH uh, about a year ago that was uh, fortunately funded uh, for the next five years for us to move these types of uh, nanoparticle treatments uh, to the point of um, dosing patients by 2028. Um, and a lot of that work is to expand what we've done in mice to uh, non-human primates, to larger animals, um, to do some uh, more extensive uh, off-target analyses, not only looking at that part of the genome, but throughout the genome to make sure that this could be as safe as possible. And uh, we're doing it not only for this um, Lieber's congenital amaurosis case of of recessive, but also a, a dominant form of, of blindness, the best disease. And the hope here is that if we're able to show um, rapid development of these formulations for any of these particular mutations, that uh, we should have a platform that could be readily customizable for other mutations that um, other patients may have. And so that's uh, the last uh, um, piece of data I wanted to share. And to summarize, uh, we are moving these genome editing uh, technologies into um, more translational studies. We think they're attractive because they avoid using viruses uh, that naturally evoke uh, an immune response in many cases. We think they're highly customizable and can be tailored to many different types of mutations. Um, and so for types, many types of inherited blindness, we're hopeful that this could be um, a, a useful treatment, a one-time uh, injection for really durable um, responses. And we're uh, working uh, very hard um, across the U.S. to try to move this forward uh, such that we can do a first-in-human trial, hopefully here in UW. With that, I want to highlight a number of folks who are instrumental to this idea and this project. Uh, first, the, the, the team here, uh, Sarah Gong, is in um, the Institute for Discovery and the Department of Ophthalmological and uh, Visual Sciences. 
Uh, Bukash Patnaik is also in that department as well as in pediatrics. David Gam um, is a uh, clinician um, scientist uh, who's really pioneered a lot of the, the human um, uh, disease modeling work and a number of both postdocs as well as graduate students have moved these projects forward and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. Are there any other uh, essentially genetic diseases that are that specifically focused to a, essentially a single tissue in the body that would be amenable to this kind of technique? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, just to repeat the question, are there other diseases that are that you know specific to a single base in a single cell type, for instance? Um, Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, some uh, cases of muscular dystrophy um, are, you know, single point mutations. In that case, the, the hope was that you could hit a muscle stem cell and fix that stem cell that could make the rest of healthy tissue. It's been very hard to deliver this type of CRISPR machinery into in, those specific stem cells. So instead, there are... Um, trials on underway to try to uh, genome edit really almost all of the muscle in, in those patients. That unfortunately um, involves a lot of virus and uh, can invoke a pretty serious immune response. So that's one thing they're working around there. Um, but these same types of um, strategies of nanoparticles or um, Viral vectors have been delivered to the inner ear to uh, treat some types of hearing loss. Uh, they've been injected into uh, very specific spots in the brain um, to uh, change, you know, a fraction of neurons that have a point mutation that could be problematic, um, that could lead to some neurological issues. Um, so, I think the there's. A lot of use cases that clinicians have come to the genome editing community with um, that are being um, investigated in a similar way. I think there's teams of engineers, chemists, and biologists that design strategies that have to be vetted in these preclinical models. Um, the other one that comes to mind is that there's a company called Verve Therapeutics. Um, they have a um, injectable uh, formulation that's uh, based upon the lipid nanoparticles that uh, have been used in COVID vaccines, but they inject it into the bloodstream and they, um, those particles end up, most of them, in the liver. And in the liver, there's a gene called PCSK9 that controls uh, cholesterol uh, levels. And so they're hoping to treat some inherited forms of uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia, and um, it could also be a um, treatment for uh, heart disease uh, as a larger market, but at the moment they're in trials uh, for that inherited form. Uh, this is a very sophisticated work. Uh, th thank you for, for sharing it with us. I have two questions. The first one, uh, more of a technical nature. So in the TEM that you showed, mm -hmm. um, the, some of the nanoparticles that looked like were individual and some were clumped together. Yep. I assume it's more effective the less clumped they are. So how, how do you go about getting them less clumped when they're injected into the eye? Yeah, that's a good good catch. Um, so I, I neglected to say that this is a, a dried um, version of the solution. So when you dry and put it on a surface, they they do end up uh, coming together in some in some cases, as as you noted. Uh, but in solution, they're actually really a pretty robust suspension. So they um, there is actually a data slide here that I didn't show that shows the diameter of uh, the particles that we have. And um, we do see 
uh, kind of a distribution that we expect from uh, essentially single particles um, in a solution. Uh, but it, it is an issue if we have clumping or aggregation in our formulation. So um, we avoid that by making sure um, some of the buffers and salts of the solution um, promote um, uh, them staying in solution and not coming together. Yeah. But yes, it is, it is part of the characterization of what we would say the drug substance that we would eventually inject into um, you know, into the patients. Okay. And my next question is, is a little more personal. How did you go from chemical engineering to <laughs> gene editing yeah. for eye diseases? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think you'll see it in, in chemical engineering undergraduate classes. About um, 20 to 30 percent end up going to med school, uh, which is surprising. I didn't know that, but once I went through undergrad, I had a really good friend who was, and a few that were very interested in being doctors. And I asked them, you know, how, does, how do these ideas relate to medicine? And they gave tons of great examples, you know, how, how do fluids go through, you know, blood vessels and, uh, you know, how does um, energy get metabolized? These are all, in some ways, uh, chemi chemistry questions. So I was intrigued by that and then, um, my undergraduate research was mostly in semiconductor work, so pretty far away from this type of work. But I, I, t I got an um, opportunity to explore biology in um, my graduate work in Cambridge and then uh, ended up being very interested in how um, engineered materials engage with human cells. And some of those engineered materials, as you see, are on this slide, right? But they're in, in nanoscale. So that has evolved into you know, what I'm doing now. Um, I would say I was also very lucky. So I started my um, lab here in August 2012, here at the Institute for Discovery. And those um, reports of the CRISPR system came out in December 2012. Um, and in some ways, I had the least um, opportunity cost of switching to that technology because I didn't, I had an empty lab, one master's student. So um, I quickly tested that um, system out side by side with what I had as state of the art. And uh, it worked really well and, and I was able to kind of pivot quickly uh, without, you know, worrying about uh, a lot of people losing projects or sunk costs into other things. Yep. Hi, uh, it's just got maybe two questions. Um, uh, one is a bit technical. The, the, the data that you showed on the mice, mm -hmm. uh, the two week delay, is that kind of how the uh, you have to cycle the channels to get that working? Or were you able to actually establish that indeed some of those cells uh, post-mortem have actually been eradicating the uh, defective copy of the gene? Yeah. That's kind of prov proving that, that you've actually done it. And, and the second question related to that is uh, with these uh, nanoparticles, uh, I kind of presume that it would be similar to what they use for COVID vaccine. Um, is this like a, the, the editing becomes a first order kinetics or is that second order as in you get multiple hits to a same genome? Because uh, if, if multiple hits are happening, would you actually be concerned about altering the original uh, non-damaged template? Yes, so um, great questions. Uh, so I'll take this, the first one here about this two week delay. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we believe this is the time that it takes for the retina to heal is, okay. is, is really the delay of this. Um, but there is also a delay that once um, the editing happens, and I think in terms of what we know from our studies in in mouse and human cells, it, the editing happens if it's inside the cell within hours. And so um, the peak happens usually within, um, 
uh, four hours of having the protein in there. And so that, that arguably has already happened right here, but why do we only see an effect here in six, right? Um, the tissue has been injured, even with that best surgeon doing the injection into the back of the eye. So it, that process of the photoreceptors and the RPE coming together takes usually about two weeks. Um, but once you, you, once you have the genetic code, you have to start making the protein, and that protein has to start to uh, come together and, and um, express well in enough of the cells. So I also think that um, is happening over this two weeks. Um, but we, you know, we didn't know exactly um, how quickly we would expect the response. We were kind of worried at two weeks, but you know, <laughs> we, we said, let's keep going and, and wash these mice out. Um, the, the second question of whether we should be worried about recutting um, has to do uh, with, um, as you said, the kinetics of the process. And uh, CRISPR will come in and keep cutting if it recognizes that sequence. And um, this is one reason why we don't want to um, express a base editor very, very long or a, a genome editor very long using viral vectors for a lifetime of a patient. So that uh, first patient that I showed, Michael Culber, uh, probably still has active CRISPR machinery uh, potentially cutting um, that mutation. Um, thus, in that case, it's, it's thought to be a, a safe issue. Uh, it, it's not a safety concern as much as here, uh, where if you had A-based changes uh, over a long period of time, you might start accumulating what people call bystander um, edits. So if you look carefully um, at the sequence, we have uh, an A-base that we're trying to fix, um, and uh, the next nearest A-base is a, quite a bit away, so on the order of about six or seven A's, uh, bases away. If there was an A here, it would be a, um, probably be modified as well. And so these are some of the intricacies of how you design um, the strategy and the types of editors that you use. Um, and this is also a reason why we really like the, the non-viral strategy, because we can control how much mRNA we have, the dosing, such that it's in some ways a, uh, a flash of activity. Uh, that goes away, and if we can uh, do that flash that it specifically hits this A and has a lower probability of hitting and changing these A's around it, then um, we have some level of control. Yeah, I got uh, just one more set of questions, more practical matter. So, the, uh, um, so these nanoparticles, uh, do they get into cross-blood-brain barrier? essentially as access to brain or neuron-based problems. Um, uh, because I know some of the viral vectors, you're not gonna have that access. Yeah, so, so this question of biodistribution is what we're gonna study in these next five years um, in these uh, animal systems. I believe, given what we've seen with these other subretinal injection studies, it's a pretty low concern. Um, because there's an approved product that put in viruses into this space, um, it, it hasn't really been seen substantially in the brain, at least in those studies. And um, really the most uh, common way that that could happen is if you have injury, um, and you do have some injury, but some inadvertent injury through the back layer of the eye into the choroid that can then uh, go into the brain. But um, I think given where uh, this route of administration has been used, we're hopeful that that's not a serious issue. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. There's a lot of chemistry that I'm fascinated by. I'm 
I'm intrigued by your synthesis of the nanoparticle, and I saw on one of your slides you had contemplated using a MOF system, metal organic framework system, and I'm wondering what led you to decide on the particular nanoparticle system that you are using now in your research. Like, is, is metal organic framework still a viable um, system to use? And I'm guessing that this is also dependent on the ease of synthesis. So, so can you speak a little bit about how easy it is to create these nanoparticles? I can. I think the person who's best uh, qualified is my collaborator, Sarah Gong. Um, but I, you know, I do can summarize kind of our experience working together, which has been that um, for various types of payloads, um, like the protein one in our first version, and then for this one, which is actually pretty good for mRNA, um, it it is a challenge to do it consistently and at scale. And so uh, we have various uh, evolution of, and various types of nanoparticles. We've been, I would say, um, she's been very creative in the types of um, particles that she's developed uh, to really try to evade some of these processes for these different types of payloads. So. Um, I think you're exactly right. The, the synthesis is key, and it is something that is an integral part of also what we're doing in the next five years, such that um, we're hopeful that everything that we make can be done consistently at high enough levels that would be enough for dosing patients. Um, one of the nice things about working in the eye is that the volumes are very small. Our eyes are not very big, especially compared to the muscular dystrophy cases that uh, I mentioned earlier where you need to dose, you know, a, uh, and sometimes a small teenager that's been uh, affected systemically. So there you have, um, you know, milliliters of products. Here we're in the microliter um, scale. Um, so again, I, th these are all reasons why we think um, this set of diseases and this type of indication is a good place to start. And then if um, some of these systems do end up becoming easy to synthesize, um, hopefully like the lipid nanoparticles that were synthesized for the vaccines, then uh, we have something that's, um, you know, de-risked in some ways and could be loaded all, with all types of editors. There's a question online, so I'll read that. Great. If you correct a gene defect in the retina, does all, down, all the downstream apparatus, such as the nerves and the brain, readjust to take input when there was no input before? Oh, uh, we haven't looked, but it's a great question. My, my sense is that is yes, um, just based upon some of the um, college-level neuroscience courses that I've taken. Um, but I, I do think uh, some of these... Um, behavioral studies uh, with these interventions, probably not yet with genome editing interventions, but with gene therapy and others, uh, suggested that rewiring in the brain happens. Um, how quickly and what the bottlenecks are, I, I don't know. No. Any more questions in here? No? Oh, right here. Okay. <laughs> uh, while you're talking, and I just keep going back to the uh, old either Nova or maybe a YouTube video that I saw some time ago about Huntington's disease, mm. where it's a single mutation, single gene, and basically the people don't know whether or not they're going to manifest, but as a manifestation, penetrance is 100%. Can, I mean, I know this is a prohibitive kind of zone here. Uh, for the, the subsequent generation, would anybody even think about kind of tinkering, playing with this and tinkering with the G, uh, germ lines? Uh, there's plenty that have thought about that case. Um, you know, I think there's some active projects in um, dosing uh, patients that already have been diagnosed. Uh, so that, that's not the germline case, but direct injection into a brain. 
to try to change those repeats. Um, it is a pretty challenging set of sequences to edit, um, but there's been, you know, I think some interesting studies out there. The germline um, question uh, has usually been um, that it's not technically safe enough to do something like that, given that there are ways to um, avoid passing that on through in vitro fertilization and, and selection, embryo selection. Um, if there is a case where uh, two individuals both have uh, the uh, Huntington's allele and want to have a genetically related child, then genome editing might be appropriate. Um, in those cases, I think there's uh, some um, scientists that would argue that that's an essential right for those two people to have, then we should enable that through this type of technology. And I would say there's other scientists that would say, um, you know, we're not there yet and we don't want to go into intentional modification of the germline. Um, so that's, that's a broad summary of that case, but it's a very interesting case. I'm glad you brought it up. Any more questions? If not, thank you so much for speaking tonight. This is a great talk.